Thank you, Esmond. All right, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And so, uh, uh, why don't you guys come up and I'll uh, introduce you. So uh, let's start out with, uh, well, why don't I go from here? Uh, Pete Meyer, sitting on my left here, is a senior ads quality analyst at Google. With a PhD in statistics from the University of Chicago, Pete started using S in 1989 for his work in biostatistics and switched to R in 2002 2003. For the past seven years at Google, Pete and his team have been using statistics to understand which ads are relevant and contribute to the user experience and which ads should be excluded. Next to him is Ajay Gopal, and he is the Director of Data Science and Analytics at CARD.com, with a PhD in Physical Chemistry from the University of Chicago, with a specialization in surface analytics and background in computational biophysics. Ajay started using R two and a half years ago during his postdoctoral research at UCLA on graph theoretical approaches to RNA genomics, and has been using it as an integral part of the analytics platform at CARD.com for the past year and a half. Next to him, is Hilary Parker, who is a data analyst at Etsy with a PhD in biostatistics from Johns Hopkins. Hilary has been using R for eight years and has been at Etsy for a little more than a year, where one of her main functions is an experiment consultant. She works with different buyer-facing product teams to help them with experiment design, opportunity sizing, ad hoc analysis of experiments, and generally understanding human behavior. Next to her is Alex Tope, and he's an operations engineer at Gravity AOL with more than 15 years of experience in systems administration, configuration management, and operating online services. Alex's experience with R has been focused on the configuration and deployment of Gravity's R production and staging infrastructure. And finally, next to him is Vlad Rejov, who is a senior game analyst at Activision with a PhD in mathematical physics. Vlad has been using R for three to four years, most recently at Activision to understand human behavior and to detect the boosting phenomenon in massively online game Call of Duty. Thank you all for coming. Advance the slide. All right, so I figured we'd start Uh, I figured we'd start with uh, giving everybody a chance to give a little background about how they're using R, how many people are in their groups, what problems are you solving with it, and so on, and then uh, we'll go from there. And just so everybody knows, we have a bunch of cards over here and pens, so if you have questions, you can ask the questions at any time, and uh, Irina, who's sitting up here, uh, will, uh, will give them to me during the talk. Okay, well, I work in the Venice office here in L.A., and uh, I work together with another analyst in a team that has about 20 engineers and 11 linguists. And we collect human eval evaluation data for people. People like yourselves, we, they sign up to work for Google and we send them a query and we'll send them an ad that show them that query and then we'll ask, how useful is this or how appropriate is this ad? And uh, so we do a lot of things in terms of sampling to get the queries and collecting of that data, trying to understand patterns in the raters. Some are good raters, some are, they're not having a good day. <laughs> uh, and so there's information like that you can glean because you want to be able to provide the best information possible for the clients who are trying to use what you collect in order to say something about whether their new format for an ad or an algorithm for placing ads is useful. So at Car.com, we're trying to make a mobile alternative to traditional banking. So our vision of the current and the immediate future is that all you need is to order a car from a website and use your phone, and that's your new bank. Um, and um, we, I mean, we've been around for about two and a half years, and part of our success is being able to scale our business through using automation. Uh, we use our right at the top of the acquisition funnel, if people know that 
Tango um, businesses where uh, we have a decision engine that decides uh, through different advertising platform APIs how, you know, how much to bid for a certain quality through a certain channel of a certain demographic of people, etc. Um, and then uh, we use our, uh, after that, uh, well, when we bring people to our website in terms of uh, analyzing the outcomes of multivariate tests. So if you go to car.com now, you're probably uh, a part of five tests. I, I think if you go to google.com, it's more like 12, right? Uh, <laughs> or you can't say. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, so we're, we're what uh, we call a program manager. So we also have the data for uh, the transactions that uh, people do on their card. So we analyze uh, patterns in that, um, and, and which inform how we acquire more customers. Uh, one, one nuance we have is that we're not a vanilla card. We, we think people are excited by different things. You might have seen a slide earlier on that we have the Sesame Street card and the Star Trek card, including the Vulcan and so on. Um, and we find very interesting correlations between what inspires people and how they behave financially. So uh, uh, we do everything, uh, everything except the last slide that Yasmin showed, where we don't have consumer-facing or customer-facing data yet, but we use R for one-offs. We use R for even for ETL, which is extract, transform, load, <coughs> um, and, and for scheduled analysis, uh, not through current app, but uh, things that uh, build tools like uh, Jenkins, for example, and. Uh, and, and then we also use it in production for our uh, you know, positioning it. Okay, how many how many people are in the team? Uh, so we've grown as a company. Our data science team, I would say, is uh, three and a half. Uh, the half is because we, we've converted one marketing person to start using our <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can everyone hear me okay? Is this yeah. mic? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, so I'm Lori Parker. Um, I work at Etsy. Um, and so, for those of you who don't know, Etsy is an uh, online marketplace for uh, buying and selling, uh, for making and selling uh, handmade items, vintage goods, um, as well as craft supplies. Um, and so, uh, Etsy is a little bigger than it uh, comes across online. There's 600 employees, and so um, the analytics team that I am on, we're the data analysts. Uh, that is now 10 people. It was eight as of yesterday, but we hired. We have two more people to start today. Um, there's also a data science team that implements uh, machine, they use machine learning in order to uh, implement recommender systems and things like that. So that's another six people. And then we have another data engineering team that maintains our databases and helps us build internal tooling. Um, and that's another 10 people. Um, so the data analysts are the heaviest users of R um, at Etsy. And uh, my function and many analysts function is to do, uh, to consult with product teams on experiment driven product development. So that just means every time that we want to develop um, a new checkout flow or something, we will uh, use a series of experiments in order to make sure that we're building the best product possible. Um, and so my function is to consult with the design, um, do opportunity sizing in order to understand um, you know, if we're building the right features, um, analyze the results of those experiments. We have an internal tool, um, not based in R, where we do a lot of the preliminary testing, but then in terms of doing an ad hoc report, you saw one earlier, just to understand exactly, like to uh, essentially get deeper dive into the data. Um, that's all done in R. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that covered actually everything. But then we also have um, some analysts who are a little more focused um, on business reporting and things, um, including the board reports that are produced. And those are all produced using R as well, and, like reproducible methods. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how we use R and Etsy. So at Gravity and AOL, we do content personalization. Um, the idea is that we track your traffic on a given content site, like TechCrunch, and we apply interest graphs that we've developed to recommend other articles that you might like on that site. Um, and obviously the better those recommendations get, the longer you stay on the site, the happier our partners wind up being with us. So what we're using R for is, uh, you saw this slide already with the, uh, the shiny and the ad hoc reporting. Its main purpose is to keep the, the sales team and the, uh, the product teams uh, busy so they leave the data team alone so that they can do other stuff. Uh, because they, they actually do have a lot of very um, 
close term interest in how did our recommendations perform yesterday because that is our, our revenue is directly tied to that because we have sponsored articles among the other recommended articles and so they want to know how well the campaigns did so they have a legitimate need for it but at the same time our data team is four people um, and they just can't be feeling those requests all day long uh, one of the things that R has been really useful for in our environment is that we are a Hadoop shop. We don't really have a traditional database. We don't have a traditional data warehouse. We're built on top of Hadoop's HDFS and HBase mostly. So R and uh, Shiny offer a very flexible platform for being able to get at that data as long as we can focus the queries so that the data we're presenting to non-tech savvy people make sense and that what they think they're asking for, they are actually getting. Um, and I think that's it. Go grab it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm part of the activation data uh, game analytics team. But what we do basically relates to our two major games, which is called Duty and Skylanders. Uh, what we try to do at our job, we try to infer uh, layers of discussion looking at the data that they generated in the game session. And it's a little bit different than everybody else is doing, apparently, because we are not really focused on marketing and sales. Our sole purpose of existence is actually to make players happy. And that's a challenging task because uh, happiness is difficult to define, it's difficult to infer from the data. And this is basically what we're trying to do. Uh, we use R in two big areas. One area is actually very common. It's one of analysis is trying to some find something that will answer immediate question that would be relevant for game design and game producers. And we use it in very much the same fashion as everybody else, just getting data from the database, log into R and doing data analysis, and deliver the result in, uh, in the form of presentation or Excel with just some reports. And another part of our activity relates to analytic services. Uh, what we try to do there, uh, Try to provide services to studios so they can actually use it to enhance games with better design and better features. I can give a few examples. For example, uh, weapon balancing is called duty is a very difficult task because every weapon is unique and every weapon has uh, unique characteristics. And balancing them across the whole population of players is a very challenging task because uh, efficient effectiveness of the weapon depends not only on the weapon but the player itself, the player's skills but he's been accustomed to the weapon long enough. And weapon balancing is a big part of what we're trying to help studio to deal with because it's a challenge and it's pretty much unique, unique uh, problem that we have to solve. This is what we do. Well, why don't we have the microphone? How large are the set sizes that you guys are crunching through and over the uh, data size? Well, it depends on the problem. Right now, we have one service in place that is uh, related to boosting. Boosting is a fight in the call of duty when uh, two people from, first of all, this is a competitive game when players play into teams trying to uh, win the match. And uh, it's based on military. Uh, basically, player runs with weapons shooting each other. I think call of duty is a very popular game in the this. And uh, sometimes what happens, in order to progress with the game faster, uh, players make agreement. Two guys from opposite teams make agreement and say, let me kill you thousands of times, and then you can do the same to me. This may be both win, we will progress with the game faster, and this kind of, not very fair, it's not really cheating, because cheating implies that there is a rule that will prevent or restrict this kind of use of the game. Uh, we call it wisdom. It's not ethical in a sense, it's actually contradictory to the spirit of the game. So we try to find these guys and not punish them, but at least do something about them. Warn them or say, like, hey, you do the wrong things, stop doing that. And for this reason, we have analytical service in place that detects these boosters and reports them to the studio. And the amount of data we crunch every day, it's a daily process. It's uh, hundreds of millions of records. And uh, it used to be 800 millions uh, per day, but now it's significantly slower because uh, during the life cycle of the game, the amount of players actually 
continue play uh, decreases. So that's that's scale. And did you have to set up a QA environment or a production environment? Uh, there's no production. The solid production. Solid production. Right. And what's the? Is it a single server that you guys are running? Is it? A uh, we have um, five node cluster running revolutional, and we use our revolutionary version uh, of R, mm -hmm. and uh, basically that's what we run. Yeah. Well, five months. It's a Chrome job that gives off all the jobs on, on the service and tries to do that. Alex, you you are also running things at a significant scale, I assume, in terms of the data. Not as much on the shiny end because we aggregate the data before it goes into shiny. Um, and so that's that winds up being important because uh, again the kind kinds of users who are generating these queries aren't ones that want to click and then go to lunch and come back and have their data, they want to click and have their data right now. So that's something our data team has done a lot with to try to get the data to manageable sizes, but not lose uh, what they're looking for. Um, we've wound up scaling by using a lot of parallelization inside of R and uh, just doing a lot of testing to see how much memory we can throw at a single problem um, and it's really the concurrency that winds up giving it a not quite real time but high response rate we can get a query back in five seven minutes um, over you know a month's worth of data sometimes which is pretty good considering the uh, going through the actual logs represents terabytes a day and do you have do you have set up the staging environments environments, QA environments for this, or is it because it's a back-end type solution? So we have uh, we have two production servers, and we do have a development environment, which also winds up being the QA environment. And we have a, a right now, a, a demo environment for um, some of the newer reports. And we're going to be standing up a new server that's going to be the host of when they're you know, really production grade and ready for the bigger hardware, the full-fledged production environment for it. Um, getting into the three-layered environments, that would be really nice. Um, but we don't even have that for a startup. So we don't even have that for a lot of the um, front-facing production stuff. <laughs> so this is actually like, this is one of the more mature products we have in that sense. Okay. Um, Hillary, would you like to speak a little bit about, like, the, on the reporting side, what, what is your workflow? What does that look like for you guys? You know, how often do you produce reports? What are, you know, people a sense of what that is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, like the bread and butter of my job is creating reports, either for teams or for, um, or for I don't know, management <laughs> people at the company, um, just in order to understand like how an experiment performed, if we've like found some sort of behavior on the site, like, like a report just explaining exactly what's going on. So I would say um, the kind of like the deliverable that I create um, using R is, as you saw earlier, sort of like a markdown document that I store in a GitHub repo um, that explains the story of an analysis, uh, tells the narrative of what we think happened, um, what we think the right like launch decision might be if it's an experiment for a product, um, or like what we think the opportunity is. Um, just essentially a readable report um, that's also my goal for it to always be reproducible as well. Um, so my workflow, we have um, sort of a similar data infrastructure. We have um, our clickstream data is on this Hadoop cluster, and then that gets rolled up into a SQL database um, that's then like easier to query. Um, so I usually pull data from either one or both of those sources um, from the experiment. Uh, do an analysis in R, I always create the same um, file infrastructure using a project template, which is an R package, like there's lots of options. So, so for every project I'll have um, a new repo, a systematic way of organizing my files. Um, I'll do an analysis, um, create a R markdown file, which I then knit into the readme file for the GitHub repo. So like my deliverable is both a very readable document that looks very nice and I tell the narrative of whatever analysis I'm doing. Um, and then it's also coupled with the actual code for the analysis. Um, so I found that that's been really successful in terms of communicating. I work mostly with software engineers. Um, most of the product teams I work on are 
primarily software engineers. So that works really well in order to uh, gain the confidence of engineers who are at GitHub all the time. Um, and then also just like creating the readable document and in that manner, I found it just really good for communicating exactly what's going on, getting the key points across. Like, and then because many people at Etsy are also not software engineers, like the product managers, um, the people in support, et cetera, um, it's easy for them to look through too. So it's kind of like this good compromise of being reproducible um, and convincing to engineers, but then also, uh, but then also readable. So. Do you guys have any use cases where you're having a batch process, or a nightly uh, process where you're kind of you know, running cron and running batch? Sorry, I have to turn one of these off. Sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and then having like, like a yeah, standard, having R a standard Yeah, having a standard analysis. Not yet, right although I'm actually, even just from things I've seen here, thinking about that in the future, especially for some ops dashboards I've been working on, um, just understanding like when to buy new servers and um, having some sort of predictive function for that. Um, and that would be great to have kind of like a nightly job that like up updates that predictive prediction. Um, so that's sort of, that's not like currently in our workflow, but it's definitely something that, um, like our nightlies right now are, are just rolling up the, the, Hadoop, the clickstream data sort in our Hadoop cluster into the SQL database. So, yeah. Jay, could, could you, does that, how, does, how does their workflow compare to how you guys work with your reports? They, we do a lot of what they do and a little bit more because yeah. uh, we rely on our live editor for pretty much all of our company and board level reporting. So um, I'd say that we have uh, scheduled reporting that uh, that involves these tools uh, both at, at the daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Um, our our um, you know, even our royalty uh, invoices for all our licensing partners are done in with never So uh, we're very committed, and we'll find out over time if uh, I was uh, I, I was to blame for it. So, um, I, I, I want to touch on a couple points that have come up earlier, which is uh, about size. Um, our data, uh, considering we're about a year and a half old is not as big as quote unquote big data. Um, so uh, we can actually get away uh, at this stage with doing all the, the test and developing on kind of our local laptops and our, uh, with our team. Um, and in, in terms of uh, the six hour hour jobs and stuff like that, we have a really uh, uber powerful instance on AWS to do that um, and we have a second lighter weight instance to do, take care of all the scheduling so that these resources don't come. And when you say it's an Uber instance, how much RAM is that? <laughs> or is it more, more CPU? Uh, uh, it's it's more, uh, it's definitely with more CPUs and all the, I would say upwards of 36 gigs of RAM. And how does that happen? Do you guys, you guys don't have to worry about RAM with the way that you're summarizing data? So uh, we, we do all of that inside of Hadoop, and yeah. so it's, it, they're not so it's not an issue. Yeah, they just yeah. have to run periodically, and they just get distributed across the, the cluster. How about you, Vlad? I mean, I'm guessing you're running things because you're running it in Rebo. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, the last one. And unfortunately, each node has only 32 gig of memory. Only 32. Only 32. It's actually not enough, so I have to. We have to break these jobs in chunks. But that's what I have. Yeah. Pete, your data set sizes are a lot smaller. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so I work on the small data side of Google. Uh, we have many hundreds of raters, which is nothing compared to the people who work with the logs, for example. But um, so we tend to bump up against boundaries when it comes to doing linear mixed effects models, which are useful if you're trying to adjust for differences among the raters. And, uh, and so you look for other ways of accomplishing the same thing. You may, you may like frequentist approaches, but you discover that they run out of memory at 32 gigs, and uh, you need more. So then you switch to Bayesian approaches, which you can run in separate strings. So R, R provides a creative armory that you can draw different tools from that that enable you to work around problems that otherwise seem difficult. 
Um, have you had to recruit folks to join your team, statisticians? Well, uh, I do have one other analyst who works in the same team. And Google kind of has a reputation of, of doing a lot of interviews, but not so many hires. Um, and it's true, I mean, we all are involved in this process. Uh, on average, every analyst interviews somebody every other week. Um, but the goal of the process is to, to find out, you know, is this somebody who would be happy working in an environment where every day you're basically meeting a new problem and trying to figure out from first principles what would be a useful way of, of analyzing it. And not necessarily looking for the best solution. You know, we're not, not really academics. Um, so if you could get a 90% solution 20% of the time, that sounds like a real one. Hillary, you said you added two members to the team. Your team is expanded by two. I, I think people might be interested in hearing about how you guys went about recruiting them, how did you find them, what were their backgrounds, etc. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I, yeah, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the manager, so I don't have a ton of, in terms of recruiting, I'm not totally sure. Um, I know that. I mean, like many companies, Etsy has a recruiting bonus, so people are very eager to share links on social media and such when we have a, an opening. Um, we, uh, the analyst team has a very, very diverse set of backgrounds. Um, the manager of the group uh, has, she was three years into a PhD in the history of science before <laughs> she decided to come over to Etsy. Um, so, and then um, there's one analyst who had, who worked at a hedge fund for several years um, before coming over to Etsy. There's um, another analyst who has a master's in econ, one who has a master's in political science. So the analyst team is kind of this diverse um, group of people. Um, I'm the only one with a formal statistics background, um, which was part of why I came to the team. I think we've grown to the size where we really needed a statistical consultant, which is what I came in as. Um, we the the new hires. One of them one of them worked at a very similar tech company and was very interested in learning more statistics, and so we decided to bring him in. Um, eager to learn and eager to work hard to do it so um, and then we actually brought in someone I was really excited about this because he had a very similar background to me which was that he was working um, as a research assistant for a neuroscientist um, so I came from this biostatistics background um, he was working um, essentially doing the same role that like, like a consulting analyst like myself would do where um, he was working with different neuroscientists and helping them analyze their data in order to like create publications um, and so I think, like, I'm very excited to work with him. I haven't, I haven't worked with him yet since he started today, and I'm here. Um, so I, but so he's coming with this background in like the more scientific computing um, environment, and so I think that, like, personally, I feel like that's translated really well into this sort of analyst role where you're consulting with teams, um, and you're kind of making those same decisions. So, um, so yeah. And do you guys, when you're recruiting any of those econ background or whatnot, are they, do they have? are and their back in their experience or are their toolbox or do you just hire for talent and then you're like well, yeah you so we, we have we're one of those i think a lot of tech companies have like 50 things listed on the application or on the uh the, the job listing that like no person would poss possibly have all these experience especially coming in as a more junior hire um but very frequently people have r that's definitely we want to type, see someone have at least r python background um and then, and then in terms of the other languages, we li we list like SQL, which you wouldn't have experience in that unless you've already worked in the industry. Um, and we, we ask them to know Hadoop languages, which you know again, like unless you're in industry, you wouldn't know. Um, and you know, like plus if you know PHP, which is what Etsy is written in, like Etsy web. Um, and so, so yeah, so we we look for specifically for our Python or some sort of analytical language. That's sort of our like. We would like to see that most, um, and I came in with just R as my back. Like I only knew R from grad school, so um, so we have some flexibility in terms of like what we look for. Um, the analyst position, especially, I think in terms of some of the other data teams, they look for more specific um, skill sets. But we do, we really we have a lot of flexibility in what we look for in terms of training, just because um, the the role is so diverse and people can contribute in different ways and. Coming into an analyst role, you have to learn so much about the company that we have like a six month ramp up. We kind of expect people not to be productive for six months. Um, just learning, like learning the database structure and things like that. So. Yeah. Well, 
Well, you guys have a good sized team. Um, yeah. How, how have you added? Yes, we're some of our security people. So how, how did you find those people? What were their backgrounds? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also put people with uh, skills and analytics, obviously, at least some some initial exposure to R or to Python, for example, and some strong uh, strong desire to work with games because well, challenges that we are having right now, like as I explained before, we have to define happiness of the player, and it's not like customer happiness <laughs> because customer buys small. In our case, players play more, and we have to find out why he plays more, and that's a difficult task. It actually means that we have to look for many, many options to explain or to, uh, yes, to find explanation for this particular player behavior and try to improve it or, uh, or do something with it. And that actually requires, we have some data. We have many, many elements with data coming from the game. And it's all very, very detailed. And it takes us, like we have brainstorming sessions and try to find out what would be a good predictor for this particular measurement that we have. It could be favorite weapon of the player, it could be something that he played with the team of party <coughs> players or force players, or what is it, maybe because of his <coughs> party. So all this stuff actually comes into consideration. It's but, but how does that help you when you're when you're looking at candidates coming in? Huh? What what are you, what what are the what are the traits that, that you say you know got creativity. I would say creativity. They have to be creative, they have to think about the problem. So they have to first of all understand what game is. It's not difficult to do, you have to play, but you have to play long enough to actually get into the mind of the player and come up with the uh, tentative hypothesis. Why is it so? And then you go to the data, try to put your insight into the data, pull the data out, analyze it, use a method that you're familiar with when you learn on as you go, and then come up with insight and explanation for this particular case. So are all the 15 analysts those that played the game the police has hired? Uh, it's actually part of our job responsibility. We're supposed to play every day all of duty for 30 minutes. <laughs> At least. <laughs> yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> I did not expect that answer. <laughs> well, that's the reality. You have to know your domain, right? So yeah. To be able to answer the question. Fair enough. So, uh, we... Yes, we was talking about issues in terms of deploying, how you take, you know, you take your, how you add new packages, what libraries do you use, how do you ensure that that is correct in, uh, in the environment that you guys operate in. Um, Alex, do you have anything else to add to what Yasmin said? Uh, yeah, as, uh, as Yasmin may have mentioned, um, for the non-CRAN packages, we've actually wound up sucking them into our own GitHub and then uh, deploying them through our own Jenkins build, just like we do with our own packages. That way we can ensure that there is a version. Many of the GitHub packages don't have a version, you just you get what's latest. And in order to be able to say that it's the same version that we QA against, we update the version in GitHub, we test that, and then we push that out. Um, and that's one of the things that I'd like to see uh, improve in R is that there really isn't a packaging system. I mean, R has its notion of packages, but it doesn't have a package manager where I can say, go install this version, and I want you to replace the old version, or I want it to be there concurrently with the version that I have. Um, and then it searches the network of different places. It goes to CRAN, it goes to GitHub, and it finds the package for me, and then installs it and takes care of the dependencies. There's the closest thing now is, is our, plan, or our command install, which isn't you know, quite there yet. Um, this is a problem that uh, a lot of other open source languages have had, but I think because R has been largely for the lab and academics, that it really hasn't been as big, as big of a, you know, this is something we need, that this server I built today is exactly the same as the server I built a year ago. Have you guys tried out Packrat yet or not? Yeah. I've looked at Packrat, yeah. and it's definitely a good start. Um, one of the things about Packrat is that it's an R package. So it's not an interface, it's an R package. So you're asking the ops guy then to know enough R to be able to use it effectively. So 
I think the next step would be to put a, a front end on that. And please don't write your own front end. Please, please, not another package manager. Pick one that's already there and use it. Because I, I already have to deal with like half a dozen and my brain's going to explode. Um, and the, the other thing too is it's just, it's just practical. Why write something to solve the same four problems everyone's already solved before? Just use RPM, use dpackage or apt or whatever you want. Let them do the stupid stuff and then all you have to do is just that last 10 lines of code that turns the metadata in the package description file into the spec file that makes an RPM and look, trust the ops guys to be able to, you know, bind the rest together. Does anybody else have any comments on that subject? Just generally about like our ops Yeah, just setup. Live, yeah, the ops setup. Yeah, yeah, so that's, it's, first of all, I know that academics do struggle with the package version <laughs> issue because I remember in grad school a paper where like the results look great and then they updated the package with the pre-processing they were using and then it was like the results did not look as good. And so it was like, man, I wish we could use the older version. But, um, not that that necessarily would make it. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we have a, and like I would you know, love to say this next to an ops engineer, hear what I'm saying wrong because this is all new to me, but we have um, our studio server, um, so every analyst, uh, every technical person at SE has a VM um, that's stored on our data servers that are offsite. Um, and so um, for the analyst version, uh, we have, we have an, we use Chef as our configuration management system and so uh, there's like an analyst role within that and that installs our studio and everything. So when a new analyst starts like two days today, um, they already have like a you know, a browser version of our running like from the get go. Um, and so that's really nice uh, for them. And then uh, in terms of this package dependency, our ops engineer was asking me about that and I did not have an answer for it. So <laughs> sounds like it's very much an unsolved problem. Um, so we still rely on just like internally uh, because again, because it's mostly for ad hoc analyses, uh, we just rely on the analysts internally updating all the packages and things. So, yeah. you guys have some unique configuration at Google. Well, yeah, we're fortunate to have enough analysts that it's worthwhile to pay somebody to pay attention to those kinds of issues. <laughs> Carl Miller, who's here at the conference, is that person for us. Um, but I thought I'd just add on two points to what's already been said. Um, one is licensing. As an academic, I never paid a whole, lot, a whole lot of attention to that. You know, these little files that say, oh, this is only to be used if you're not doing it commercially. And we pay a lot of attention to that at Google. Uh, you know, it is important not to do no evil. And so that's one of the things that we look at. And some, Sometimes I know, uh, like Tim Hesterberg, who's also here, was busy chasing down the author of a package uh, who cited another package that had a few lines of code in it that we didn't need, but that tied it to a non-commercial use. And uh, it took him, I think, a year and a half to, to finally sort through that all, but was able to do that. But that's because you have a central repository. We know exactly what packages are in there, which ones we're allowed to use, which ones we're not allowed to use, uh, haven't been approved. Um, so licensing, and I think the dependencies issues is important. You, you don't want to have to have people in all parts of your company reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. You'd like, if somebody in finance has a, a neat application or a good way of analyzing something, you'd like that to be available to people in engineering or in, in ops or whatever. And that only works if everybody's agreed that these are the dependencies that are available, they're, they're versioned pro properly, they play well with all of your C code, your Java code, and the other things. So, um, so those are things that are important to do, and, and the more you grow, at some point, it's it's worth investing in the person who will help make that happen. Yeah, we just chip in a couple of thoughts here. Um, so we we run in the cloud on Ubuntu, and we we run into issues where there are Ubuntu grant packages that kind of sometimes don't work when they work when you also get uh, packages from from grant directly, which are probably a later version. So 
we've run into some issues, so maybe I need to talk to uh, your guy in the audience. Yeah. Um, uh, but we, we try to get around it through kind of t treating our analysis servers uh, as part of our technology product. So uh, we manage versions uh, through public scripts. I don't know if people are familiar. Uh, but so we have a master and slave, and uh, we make sure that if something breaks down, it can be reduced. So, Yes, please, come on. I love Chrome Remote Desktop. Now, I don't know if you know what that is, but it allows you from a laptop to take control of a Linux machine somewhere if you want, or whatever machine you have uh, administrator rights on. Is that available to the rest of us? It's free for everybody. I use it at is home. It outside, outside of the Google? Oh, yeah. I use it at home to control my telescope. So I, the telescope, telescope. <laughs> the telescope connects to a Windows machine, and I can remotely control that from a mind, from an iMac. So it's it's wonderful, and it's a free tool, and it's what most engineers and analysts use to connect to their Unix machine that runs Ubuntu. So Google doesn't worry about having a system for Windows and Macintosh and Ubuntu. It's just Ubuntu. But you can get to it from anywhere. And there's never any, you don't have to worry about somebody walking around with a laptop that has company data on it. That's a bad plan. Well, but analysts, we like having control of our own machine and having the data local. It's still a bad plan. And using something like Chrome Remote Desktop, which is free, allows you to connect to a secure machine wherever it is through you know, remote, uh, you know, whatever your system uses for remote connections. So anyway, free tip, check it out. Um, a question from the audience. Why did you choose R as opposed to other languages like Python? What's that? I could go by default. Um, Closest mic away. Let's see. Um, for a few different reasons, because uh, uh, it's through that uh, research and postdoc work, I was mainly using analytical maps or Mathematica and then MATLAB uh, for the, the numerical stuff. Um, and I attended one bioinformatics conference, uh, actually not far from here in UC Riverside by Thomas Gerke. I don't know if some people in the audience from Bioconductor know him, he's a pretty prolific contributor. Um, and uh, I realized that I could do pretty much everything, including write the shell scripts I was writing for Ubuntu from within R. Um, and it, it allows me to preserve my thought flow, you know, even without an editor, just through commenting. Um, and um, over time, I realized that its ability to, to script as well as do object oriented stuff uh, actually is a very powerful recruiting tool because a lot of people pick up the syntax from very, very easy. Anybody else? Have? Yeah, um, I mean, I used R um, in graduate school, so there was like, no question that I was going to continue using it at Etsy. Um, I've seen other analysts sort of making this decision between R and Python, for example. Um, and I mean, I think uh, access to the plotting, um, the, the Hadleyverse, as it's called, ggplot, and all these things, uh, that can be a, like a pretty huge, huge draw. Uh, and I, I mean, personally, I think that there, uh, there's a lot of appeal for IPython notebooks. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but um, you can, I mean, you can, I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna phrase this right, but you can like run R from within those, or you can like, like so you can like, so, the people who are uh, using Python, the analysts who use Python, will still end up using R to do all the plots. And so, um, so one analyst I know who kept going back and forth, and like people were trying to convince them one way or the other. He, uh, I think he settled on R just because it was like, well, I'm going to be using this for the plots anyway, and I just want to have like one consistent experience. Um, yeah, and so. Um, yeah, um, and I certainly, I know that there's a lot of interest from people outside, like their software engineers who asked me to teach them R, um, and I think actually was talking with Yasme, talking about how people think that this means they're going to learn statistics, so I think that's still very analogous, like, if they want to learn statistics, so they're like, I need to learn R, 
Um, and so, so yeah, so but it's been, um, I think I haven't seen anyone trying to do any, especially with like graphing or trying to do the uh, reproducible documents, I've never seen anyone try to use a different language for those at Etsy. All right, great. Are you going to do any more questions from the audience? Five minutes. Yeah, it ends at five minutes, so I just wanted to make sure we got a couple of questions in before that. Um, so one of the other questions that we got from the audience was, what are the biggest challenges that you've had with R? What are the things that, I mean, Alex has already told us a little bit about what he wishes would be better. Um, if, you, uh, if you had one or two wishes, what are the things that you would like to see improved in R? Uh, the big problem that we find with R is scalability, and so we have to do a bunch of tricks to actually make it work on the big scale. And, well, R is pretty old language, pretty old software, as you know. So the first thing that we did is through our data frame and we use data table, and that improved the performance drastically. I would recommend everybody to use data table because it's an easy way to actually to make your application scale if you're thinking about, about doing it in the future. And uh, I also want to emphasize that there is, uh, we use also RS, RCA PPE package because some parts of this uh, framework that we built was actually rewritten in C++. Original uh, R function that we used when we do it modeling was way too slow, so we had to rewrite it in C++ and use this awesome package RCA PPE. That's basically uh, scaling. And I think our community makes the right move in this direction, partially to, uh, to provide some hooks and to uh, high efficiently written software in C or C, C++ or for RAM and make them accessible from R. I think uh, John Chambers actually emphasized this this morning. He said that this is the way R most likely will be moving forward, try to build these interfaces to other highly efficient and highly performing libraries. And that's, I guess, goes the right direction. I actually have a quick one. No more cute names for things, like <laughs> use R that make them impossible to find in search engines. It's <laughs> <laughs> definitely not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cultural thing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I have a couple of things. I'll, I'll, I'll echo the, the part about scalability one. When you have a certain data flow or an analysis flow mapped out. Uh, one, one other thing is interaction between uh, outputs of functions. Uh, so if you, if you have recursed analyses or uh, you know, outputs of some function going into other functions, uh, one of the problems we've had as a startup is our data is scaling faster than our infrastructure. Um, so, uh, yeah, we did the one bad thing we were told not to do it at the end of uh, this morning session, which is we optimized at our scale a year ago, uh, and <laughs> we paid for it. So uh, we find that all the functions and definitions of key metrics, uh, the way they're set, are not scalable. Uh, and then, you know, it, uh, we've been very focused on the analysis because that's what gets us through the next phase of funding, but now we're at a point where we find, you know, we needed a more coherent overview of how the functions are going to interplay uh, and interact, and I think that's one challenge. That challenge. Not enough challenge for you. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So in terms of, for, on the scaling side, what, what do you guys, you know, a question we're getting from the audience here is, what helps scale more? Is it more memory? Is it more disk? You know, what, are, what, are, what vector seems to have the best impact, or does it not matter? I'd say for us, it's memory efficiency uh, and parallelization. Um, so number of cores? Yeah, number of cores, and ideally, uh, if being able to scale off of the single machine, going into the cluster model. Um, because there's only so much you can cram into one box. And so today the boxes that you're running with though are, are 
like you said, 30, 32 leagues in a row? Uh, the ones we're looking at now, there are the, uh, the 64 to 128 gig range um, and 64 cores. 64 cores? Yes. Great. Um, the other question from the audience is what are the kinds of databases that are people connecting to with R? Yes, which packages, which additional packages do you use to access them? Yeah, um, I, SE uses Vertica, which is a proprietary SQL database. Um, and so there's a package called, I think it's like RJDBC, or some combination of this. Yeah, everyone's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to go back and copy it because I never remember. Um, and so that one you can, I, I'll run my SQL queries from within an R instance, um, just because I want all my code in one R script. Uh, Rather than having to like it, like again, because of I want my I want my analyses to be like one click reproducible, just completely like read at the file, it repulls from the database, et cetera, et cetera. And I basically I'm, right now I'm at like three command reproducibility. I know a make file could make that go away, but um, but yeah, so I use that. Or um, we have an older database, so we just I just do like R my SQL. Um, but I know there's probably other ways to do this, uh, but that's been very efficient. For I've even figured out how to, if anyone, this took me a little while, so if anyone wants to know, I figured out how to, I save the query as a character vector, and then I actually print that in my uh, SQL, because most of the other analysts just want to see, or especially the PMs, they want to see the SQL query, and so I'll print that in my Nitter document, but it's actually printing an R object, but I'll like get the syntax highlights for SQL and everything, so this was like something I spent like way too long figuring out. <laughs> <laughs> made me really happy at the end of the day. So. Glad you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we use Greenplum, which is spin off of Postgres, a uh, distributed version of Postgres. And uh, it was great. Uh, fortunately, for Postgres, there is old driver, our Postgres SQL something. And actually, it comes back to optimization for scaling. Uh, what we find out that the driver is not capable of actually putting through so much data. So we ended up actually writing. Uh, Feed the data to the file and then read the file from the R. So it actually was faster than going through the driver itself. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's the reality. And another thing I want to bring up uh, regarding to scaling uh, databases nowadays are pretty sophisticated, and some of them actually equip it with analytical engines. If you can use it, use it. Because it's there, otherwise it's just sitting there with nothing. So, my suggestion to actually put some of the analytics, or at least pre processing, to the SQL query, or even there is Markey, for example, as a part of Posits, which is great, and you can do some analytics in the database, and that's a great way to scale your application. Okay. A mixture of different things, possibly one unexpected one. Uh, so, we use uh, MySQL for relatively small the database. Um, things of, uh, for data of the kind that returns uh, the result of the query in less than three minutes. Uh, and um, we also have uh, MariaDB, which is related, synonymous, I guess. And uh, more recently, we've had to switch into HDFS and uh, querying HDFS. We do that through Clutter and Paula. So we use uh, R and Paula, uh, which you do, I think, uh, JDBC drivers, um, but uh, I, I think there are some challenges there in terms of if if you're getting out too many rows from Impala, uh, the output of the data takes longer than how long the query takes. To so, uh, so I think uh, to be honest, there are uh, workarounds where you can actually save it as an external table and get the flat file, and that's extremely fast. So, uh, I would say flat files are part of our data. Uh, they don't have access to your databases. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do open source a lot of things. Uh, protobuffers, MapReduce that became Hadoop outside, uh, a lot of those things. But I think uh, the thing that I think will... So a lot of these are, sol are technical solutions, but I think this is a place where statisticians could contribute something. So we need new algorithms that are proven to converge to the correct solution, although they work in parallel. And there's, there's, there's new work in this, in this area, but I think this is another area where, you know, we, sh we should invest more thought. Yeah. 
All right, we're out of time, but since we said a little late, I feel like it's okay to run over. Any final words of advice that you have uh, for the audience? If you're getting into art, if you're looking to get things into production, just you have to distill your knowledge <laughs> to one piece of advice. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but I know a lot of the software engineers I work with are really interested in R. So, like this entire like chef setup that we have for analyst role VMs, um, like that was just kind of a mutual like, hey, I'll help you with statistics if he helps set this up. And so, um, so I found that it's pretty easy to like garner enthusiasm. Um, another like fortunate enthusiasm generating uh, instance that happened during my work life was that I was in the middle of a meeting um, and we had we were updating we were like repulling the data from the Hadoop cluster and so um, I was like oh this report's a little out of date and the engineer was like oh actually I just updated the you know like the data table is up to date and so I was like oh let me reknit this document really quickly I just went through and like recreated it from this group of engineers and they were like oh my god how did you do that <laughs> <laughs> so that was really exciting and definitely like got everyone was like like it, it definitely was very impressive to the engineers on, on the team. So, um, so that was like another good way of just kind of like justifying that the like recreate. It was also awesome because I was like, oh, this number is going to change by this amount, and then it did, and it was just like yes. <laughs> and so, um, so that was a good way of kind of convincing everyone that like this op setup is worth it. Like everything was kind of worth like this, like being able to just like recreate an analysis, like like a full report like that, um, like convincing people that's worth it, and, like. Like, I thought that was like pretty successful, so maybe try doing that in front of a group sometime and <laughs> impress everyone, so. Um, script out, or at least take notes on every change you make in your development environment. Um, use tools like Packrat that will create a manifest of all of the virgin versions you have, because you're gonna forget at least one thing when you move that into production, and it's not gonna work, and you're not gonna know why, it you, were, you made your change six months ago, you have no hope of remembering it, and you're gonna spend a week trying to sort it out. Save yourself the time ahead. Well, I don't really know what to say, but I'll try to come up with something. Um, like in terms of data analysis, in terms of analytics, I think the most critical part of successful analysis to keep asking questions of yourself, to double guess, okay, is it right, is it wrong? Maybe I make mistakes here and here and try different methods to prove what you already found. That's what I would actually suggest. Yeah. Tell you about. Yeah. Also, plus one on that. Like, <laughs> verify and then verify again and then verify a third yeah. time. Different data sources. That's totally key for analysis. I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Uh, I don't know uh, how many people here are academicians or students or looking for opportunities outside of academics. I don't know, can we get a show of hands? Uh, it, it's pure, okay. Um, I see this dichotomy in terms of hiring. Um, there are periods in during the growth of a company when there's a need for people who really understand uh, the statistics and have a good intuition for what types of processes lead to what types of statistics and how these interact. Uh, we, we just passed that phase. Uh, and there's a period when you need to solidify uh, your product, the, the statistical analysis as a product, and that's when uh, companies start to need uh, our developers. Um, and I think we're in kind of the honeymoon of uh, data and statistics uh, for the next 10 years, and uh, like car.com, uh, a lot of companies are gonna need hardcore R developers. I think uh, in general, nobody, uh, very few people uh, are going into R because they love coding R. Uh, in, I see more often people love statistics and they, they kind of trickle into R. Uh, and I'd say if you love programming and you like fixing problems like what you heard here today, then uh, there's a, a lot of potential for uh, like really good R work. Something I never did as an academic. Unit tests and code reviews. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'd like everybody to join me in thanking our panelists and uh, thank you for coming out tonight.